Today, we're going to consider diabetes at its diabolical worst. It's one thing to float through many of your latter years with your blood sugar slightly on the high side, and some people can manage to still live to old age with few physical manifestations in such a case, even though diabetic. But when diabetes forces your blood sugar sky high, robs you of your health at an early age, and threatens to lop off decades of your latter years, is there anything you can do? To put a human face on severe diabetes, I want to share with you the story of the baseball player Jackie Robinson, who had severe diabetes attack him very early in life and almost immediately began to destroy his health. In the end, it took his life way too early. Before we get into Jackie's diabetes, I want to share a little bit of his story and his place in history for those of you who know very little or nothing about him. In the 1940s, baseball was truly America's premier sport. Sure, there was football and basketball, but baseball was king in those days. People did not just go to baseball games, they would listen to them on their radios, in their homes, or in their shops, or in their cars. Listening to an exciting baseball game and rooting for your home team was drama at its finest. But in the early 1940s, Major League Baseball was entirely white. There were no black baseball players in the majors, no black managers, and almost no blacks in any capacity connected with baseball. Now, there was no law against blacks being involved in Major League Baseball. It was simply an unwritten rule, known and understood by everyone, blacks and whites. Baseball at the Major League level was a whites-only sport, and woe to anyone who suggested otherwise. After World War II, the president of the Brooklyn Dodgers, a man named Branch Rickey, took it on himself to change all of that. Now, he knew it wasn't going to be easy. He planned to bring onto his team one black baseball player who was incredibly skilled and who could keep his composure in facing the mockery and the protests that would surely come his way. At last, he decided on Jackie Robinson, who at the time was playing in the all-black Negro Leagues, and was an outstanding athlete. Robinson had attended UCLA earlier and had starred in basketball, football, track, and baseball. In fact, Robinson considered baseball his weakest sport. Ricky asked for a meeting with Jackie, who was shocked to hear from him and curious what he might have to say. Branch Ricky laid his cards on the table, and he told Jackie Robinson he felt it was high time to integrate baseball and he'd like him to be his man to initiate the beginning of the end of this unwritten rule of segregation. He warned Jackie that he would face intense persecution and ridicule from players on the other teams and probably even some from his own team, and certainly from the baseball fans in the stands. He warned him that he would be called every name in the book and that he must not fight back or even argue with his persecutors. He'd have to keep his cool ignore the haters, and play great baseball. If he did that, eventually he would win the American public over, and after a while, he could begin to respond to criticism or mockery the way any other ball player would do. But for now, he would have to hold his peace and never allow himself to be pulled into a fight, either verbal or physical. Well, Jackie Robinson became suspicious. Although Branch Rickey seemed to like him, now he was telling him not to defend himself. He asked, are you looking for a Negro who's afraid to fight back? Rickey exploded, Robinson, I'm looking for a ball player with the guts enough not to fight back. And that simple statement convinced Robinson that Branch Rickey was his friend and was not trying to strip his manhood from him. Jackie Robinson agreed. He would play for the Dodgers, and he would keep his mouth shut. He spent his first year in the minor leagues and played at a torrid pace, hitting a spectacular 349 as a batting average. The next year, Branch Rickey brought him up to the major leagues. It was just as bad as Rickey had predicted. Robinson was cursed, and people used every racial slur they could think of to mock him and pressure him to quit baseball. But Jackie, true to his word, kept his mouth shut just like he had promised the Dodgers president. He did this not for himself, but for all the black athletes who would no doubt follow him into professional Major League Baseball if he could make good and avoid controversy. 
At times, players on the opposing teams would deliberately spike him on the legs or ankles. Jackie never fought or even said anything. He never criticized the umpires. He kept his mouth closed. There were two white men who not only encouraged Jackie in those early days, but helped him to understand that not all whites were bigots. One, as mentioned, was Branch Rickey, whom he soon began to look on not just as a boss, but as a father. And it's touching that Jackie Robinson's respect for Branch Rickey was such that he could never call him by his first name or even his full name. Jackie always referred to his sponsor and advocate as Mr. Rickey, even at the very end of his life. He was deeply and intensely grateful for this kind man who took such an interest in him. His other great friend was one of his teammates, a shortstop called Pee Wee Reese. During one game in his first season, the crowd was heckling Jackie mercilessly and viciously. Pee Wee Reese decided to make a statement, not with words, but with his actions. He went from his shortstop position over to talk to Jackie, and as they talked, he put his arm across his shoulders. It was a powerful demonstration of solidarity with the rookie ball player, and people instantly got the message. In my mind, this was one of the greatest moments in American sports history, and others apparently think so too, as this moment has been turned into a statue. As the season went on, most of Jackie's teammates were drawn closer to him due to the unfairness that was shown him by the other teams, plus the fact that he was an outstanding baseball player. In the end, he led his team to a National League championship and into the World Series. Next year, he played well, and finally, after two years of total pacifism and turning the other cheek, Branch Rickey called him into his office and told him, Jackie, you're on your own. You can be yourself now. Jackie knew that from this point on, he was now allowed to argue with umpires, to shout at players who shouted at him, and to fight back against someone who was physically aggressive. So with this new freedom, Jackie Robinson had his best season, in fact, the best one of his career, hitting 342, and he was named baseball's most valuable player. He was now a star, and the rights of blacks to play baseball could never again be seriously questioned. Jackie Robinson went on to a 10-year career of excellence and was inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1962. Now, I know a 10-year career may not sound like too much these days, but keep in mind that due to racism, plus his years in the service during World War II, Jackie did not even begin to play Major League Baseball until the age of 28. Okay, there's your little history lesson. Now let's get to the diabetes side of Jackie Robinson's life. Sadly, there's not nearly as much information about Jackie's diabetes as we might hope. What kind of A1C did he have? We don't know. What kind of average glucose levels did he experience? Again, we don't know. We do know he took insulin and experienced diabetes far worse than most. The reason we know so little is that Jackie himself did not like to talk about his diabetes. There is a bit of disagreement, but it appears that he was diagnosed with diabetes toward the latter part of his baseball days. Teammate Roy Campanella said, I was Jackie's roommate for a long time before I knew anything about his diabetes, and the other Dodgers never knew. The only time he talked to me about it was late in his career when he was considering a knee operation. He said he was afraid because I don't think it will heal right because I have diabetes. The narrator of Ken Burns' documentary on Robinson said, In 1952, at age 33, Jackie Robinson was diagnosed with diabetes, which is a really young age to have serious diabetes or even any kind of diabetes. It is reported that by the end of his baseball career, he was already beginning to have problems with his vision. His wife, Rachel, stated this. The doctor also found that his heart was deteriorating. It was a big shock to both of us because it meant our lives were going to change forever after that. And they did. He did not want to discuss it with anyone and never talked about what changes he had to make in order to keep playing. Jackie retired at the age of 37 and spent the rest of his years in business, but had an understandable passion for civil rights. His diabetes progressed from bad to worse as the years went by. Over time, Jackie's symptoms worsened. 
He developed terrible neuropathy in his legs, and the painful burning forced him to give up golf. His sight became so bad that by his late years, he had lost all sight in one eye, and the other seemed to be following in the same path. During various events, he had to be led by his wife's hand on his arm. He sometimes signed autograph books upside down. His blood pressure, well, it suffered as well and soared way out of range. This man who had once struck terror into the opposing teams with his lightning speed now could only shuffle along and limp. Jackie wrote an autobiography in his latter years, but he barely mentions his diabetes. His generation believed in keeping silent about your weaknesses, and he practiced this to perfection. Some have criticized him for this, and perhaps he might have encouraged diabetics by letting them know that even famous people, even athletes, even historical figures can be stricken by this terrible affliction. But the truth is, what our world needs is not simply to have all the diabetics speak up and say, I have diabetes. What we really need to hear are diabetics speaking up and saying, yeah, diabetes attacked me, but I drove it away by doing A, B, and C, and by stop stopping from doing X, Y, and Z. And of course, that's what this channel is all about. We've posted testimony after testimony of men and women who have beat diabetes and seen their glucose levels go down into the normal or near normal range. At the end of his life, Jackie Robinson was honored at a World Series game where his number was retired and he was allowed to throw out the first ball. The camera is mercifully cut away from him and showed the crowds cheering as he was slowly led to the microphone. He spoke well, shook a few hands, and went back to his seat few people realizing that he could see very little or that his legs were killing him. About a week later, Jackie came from the bedroom and grabbed his wife, needing physical support. But she was not strong enough to hold him up, and he collapsed to the floor. He died shortly thereafter of a heart attack, his third heart attack in the last five years. He had also had a stroke in those years. Jackie didn't really look like an old man at the age of 53, but he walked like one, and he felt like an old man. Still, not even in his mid-50s, his health, the strength of his once powerful legs, his eyesight, and his life had been stolen from him by a thief we call diabetes. 25 years earlier, Jackie Robinson was just getting started in his baseball career with the Brooklyn Dodgers. Now he was gone. And 25 years is a very short period of time to go from youth, vitality, and incredible athleticism to weakness, heart failure, and death. In researching Jackie's life, I've come across a couple of things that may give a little insight into Jackie's diabetes. First, it is reported that he had very poor eating habits. After his first year in baseball, he went with some friends on a speaking tour. And by the time he came back, just in time for spring training, Jackie was 25 pounds over his playing weight from the previous year. Throughout his career, his weight would fluctuate in a big way from year to year and season to season. If you look at pictures of Jackie in his first season and then at his last season, it's clear that he gained a lot of weight over those 10 years. Did his weight cause his diabetes or did diabetes cause the weight gain? Probably a little of both. Another little hint about Jackie's diet is from an interview that his wife Rachel did years after Jackie was gone. She told how they met, and when she was asked how her mother liked Jackie, she replied that her mother liked almost everything about him, except for the fact that he would never eat vegetables. He was strictly a meat and potatoes man. In other words, high carb and high fat, which is probably the worst diet of all. Additionally, all those weight fluctuations probably came from eating lots of sugar and snacks. Alexandra Simon wrote this, Unfortunately, he had spent years with a series of health issues, physical and internal illnesses. He also had poor eating habits that contributed to his varying weight loss and gains. One reason that Rachel Robinson's mother was appalled at Jackie's eating habits was that she and her family were very much into healthy eating, at least healthy eating in accordance with the knowledge they had available in those days. And here's a real shocker for you. Jackie's wife, Rachel, is still alive today, over 50 years since her husband passed away. And you want to know another shocker? She's at the time of this video 100 years old. 
Well, here are three very simple takeaways from this little biography of Jackie Robinson. First, diabetes is a serious problem. Jackie probably lost three decades of his life to it. For us to get diagnosed as diabetic and simply try to, quote, watch our sugar is insanity. People sometimes mock me for being a bit strict and severe in my dietary recommendations, but the truth is diabetes is a monster, and it will not normally respond to nice, gentle, mild, little, moderate efforts. Moderation in all things does not apply to attacking diabetes. Attack this enemy viciously, aggressively, and with every weapon you can lay your hands on. Second, exercise and muscles are not the answer to diabetes. Yeah, they can help a bit, but you cannot outrun a bad diet. And being a world-class athlete with incredible reflexes and fantastic coordination does not guarantee you won't succumb to diabetes. And third, be encouraged because you live in the day that you do. Not only is racism on the retreat, but we know so much more than we once did about diabetes. Most of Jackie's physical deterioration occurred in the 1950s and 60s. By 1972, he was gone. And in those days, there was no YouTube, Jason Fung wasn't even born, and Richard Bernstein was not yet a doctor. Today, we know things that were not available to Jackie Robinson. We know that the key to controlling soaring runaway blood sugar and hyperinsulinemia is through a low-carb diet and time-restricted eating. Now, I cannot prove it, but I suspect that had Jackie Robinson adopted these two lifestyle interventions while still in his 30s, he might well have lived into his 80s and continued to be a blessing to his wife, his family, and to America for three bonus decades. If you want to learn more about the specific diet that drives down blood sugar and chases diabetes from your life, check out my video, If I Had Sky High Diabetes, What Would I Do? We cannot do anything for Jackie Robinson, but you can sure do something about your own life. You can change your destiny. You don't have to fall apart, go blind, and shuffle along through your latter years. Rise up, get motivated, and drive the monster of diabetes away from your door by the grace of God. If you've recently been diagnosed with diabetes and you've just discovered this channel, let me recommend that you go to our uploads page, which will give you access to every diabetic video we've posted since we began. As you work your way through all our videos, I believe you'll find the help you need. A link to our uploads page is in the description.